So I'm not a restoration guy that got into franchise. I'm a franchise guy that got into restoration. Um, when we were looking at what business, my partner, Zach Nolte, and I, when we were looking at what we were going to do, um, we started, forget about industries. We just had a piece of paper and we made a playbook of what we wanted. We wanted, we were both affected by recessions in our last business. We wanted recession proof. We wanted third party to pay. That means either insurance, the government, giant companies, something where you could pay the bill easily, not people. My last business paid, people paid, you know, small business owners paid and they felt the money a lot more than the insurance company would or the government. Um, so we wanted third party pay. We wanted recession proof. We wanted pandemic resistant. Um, and then we wanted an industry that was growing. Uh, outside of that, there's a lot of industries, but then we also wanted a large labor pool. So we didn't want skilled labor. We wanted non-licensed labor. So plumbing, I love. It's all those things we mentioned, except people need a special skill. Restoration, believe it or not, anyone with a smile and a good attitude and, and good with their hands can do the, the work. So our labor pool is bigger. So I'm not Welcome to the Art of Franchise Marketing. Each episode takes a deep dive into the franchise space and explores how the biggest and best brands handle national branding, franchise development, employee recruitment, and localized marketing on a daily basis. This podcast is brought to you by Medsertive, a localized digital marketing partner for franchise networks. Medsertive's Madeline Park talks shop with franchise executives to discuss what's working, what's not, and answers the question, what else can you be doing? to excel at the art of franchise marketing. All right, welcome back, everyone. Thanks for listening in to the art of franchise marketing. Today, you know him, you love him. We've got Dan Claps from Voda on here. Dan, thanks for joining us. Yes, thank you. I'm excited to, uh, to have this chat. I know, I feel like it's long overdue. When you were like, oh, let's get on the podcast, I was like, haven't we done one? I was like, oh shit, no, we haven't. <laughs> So before, for anyone who might not know you, um, one, I recommend that they follow you on LinkedIn, obviously. And then two, do you want to kind of give us an overview of who you are, what you're doing and how you got into the franchise space? Because it definitely wasn't linear. It wasn't like, Hey, I'm going to start this company and I'm going to franchise it. And here I am, you know, you've kind of been, had your hand in, in a lot of different, uh, aspects of it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for asking. You know, uh, in franchising, you've got franchisors and you've got suppliers. They're two different you know, areas. I call myself a, a Zor plier because uh, I've always stayed connected to the supplier world because that's where I come from. And, and now I'm obviously focused on, on, on being a franchisor. Um, I got in franchising in 2014. Um, I joined a franchise system called Murphy Business and Financial and I was 22. So I was super early in my career. I've really only been in this space um, outside of, you know, a couple other, you know, small business I had in college. And so I only know this industry. Uh, friends of mine sometimes uh, are like, you know, you don't realize how different your industry is than ours. You know, everyone knows each other in ours and it's it's a great space. But um, I got in and uh, I don't think I'm ever going to leave. It's it's kind of welcome me with open arms and uh, I'm just going to stick to, you know, to an industry I love. So what are you doing now? Yeah. So I, uh, well, you know, I, uh, I got in franchising, as I mentioned, I was a franchise and business broker. And then I started, uh, co-founded a lead generation company and did that till last year and then sold that business to, to PE. So, um, now I am franchisor. So, uh, Voda cleaning and restoration, we're a cleaning and restoration franchise. Uh, we, you know, acquired the brand earlier this year in February, and we are, uh, really the only franchise to do both cleaning and restoration. So we clean floors, carpets, tile and grout upholstery. And then we also do restoration, which for anyone who doesn't know, that's extracting water out of homes, out of businesses, drying homes and businesses, mold, fire and smoke. And so we do those two different kind of franchise models in one, one business. And talk to me about your decision process. I mean, you know how difficult it is to build a franchise. You, you know, you built the lead portal, which if anything, that is like a, the, one of the harder parts of franchising. So why become a franchisor now? You know, you sold, uh, your, your business to PE, which probably had a really great out. Um, and then you kind of jumped back into the fire. So I'm, I'm wondering why. Yeah. Well, well, first thing I think I was 29, just about to be 30 when we sold, um, you know, uh, I have to still work. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, uh, at, at, at 30 years old, there's, there's really no amount of money that, you know, you're just going to not be working. Um, right. and, you know, it was a good exit, but it, you know, it wasn't like I was, uh, retiring onto a yacht or anything like that. And so for me, uh, what was very important was I loved my previous business very much. We sold, um, I knew that I, I'm very driven by building a business, probably more so than money. I love working with people and seeing them grow. And, um, so what I did was I took that transaction and said it was capital. I'll never forget mm -hmm. telling my, my dad, said like, what are you going to do? What are you going to buy? I did nothing. I changed not one thing. I didn't want buy one thing. That money wasn't mine. It was capital. So I put it right toward what I would do next. Um, I also know starting a business in my early twenties was easier and I already had less life commitments than I do now. And as you get older, there's just more life commitments. And so starting a business, uh, is like, you know, what is, uh, it's like eating glass. And so I knew that if I, you know, didn't go right into doing something pretty quickly, the kind of the momentum, you know, it's like, you know, when you go to college, if you do a gap year, the chances of actually going back to school is so low. Sure. Um, you gotta just get it done. I felt mm -hmm. like whatever I did next, I had to just jump in, um, as fast as possible. And it's funny just to put a, a pin in that, you know, I had, you know, started Voda or well, franchise playbook, our company that owns Voda in, in the same year that I sold the previous business and people are like, why don't you take time off or whatever? But mm -hmm. you gotta realize like that year I was able to reinvest my capital, um, mm -hmm. pretty quickly. And, you know, from a tax perspective, it was something that was smart. And so for me, it was like, let's just get going. And then the last thing I'll say is, you know, if you're making a certain amount of money and you stop making that amount of money, every month that goes by that you're not making that money, you're, you're actually losing that money, right? It's not like you're, right. you know, so, uh, anyway, a little too detailed, but got into Voda and I'm really, I'm glad I did because it is true. I've eaten some glass, got some bloody teeth, but, uh, <laughs> now we're starting to come out of that, that time frame. So it's, uh, I'm glad I started versus waiting. Yeah, no, and that's such a good point. It's like one of those, like, oh, I'm just going to close my eyes for a second, and then you wake up six hours later, and it's dark out, and you don't know what day it is. Um, so I think that we are like two ships passing in the night. We're both very busy, lots of connections in the space. And for me, I see your schedule. I see where you are everywhere. And I'm like, how the fuck does he do that? Like, you say you have more life commitments now than in your, in your 20s. But I mean, you are grinding. So talk to me about what that's like. Because I think a lot of people think, oh, the CEO, he's got a lot of people underneath him, you know, he, he, he's got it made, right. And you are very transparent in terms of the hustle mindset. And I know that you just said that it kind of lights you up to build a business. So talk to me a little bit about what your day to day is like right now with kind of this infancy of, of Voda and what it takes on your end to make sure that eventually, sure, maybe you can get to a more balanced, less hustle mental or mindset or, or schedule. Um, but until then, you know, this is what it takes. And, and the reason I ask is because I think a lot of people who don't understand franchising think it's the easy way out. They think it's an easy way to build a business or I'm just going to franchise and that'll take some of the responsibilities off my plate. And it, that's just, as you and I know, simply not the truth. Yeah. Well, well, first thing I, I give you a lot more credit than me because I'm, I don't have a fan. I don't have kids yet. And so like, I <laughs> give you a lot, you know, it's, that's a whole different, you know, ballpark. And so, you know, it's funny. I'm actually, something I've been working on lately is um, I can't, my reason for success so far has been two reasons, uh, unwavering optimism. Um, I, I try to be as nice, nice as I can to people and, you know, so wait optimism and then work ethic. But I've come to realize that if I want to have a family one day, my way of winning can't just be that I can work nights and weekends and, gr you know, grind it out. Um, right. So that, that's the first thing I'll say is I don't think that's the way to do things. Um, for me, you know, I went so into Voda that, you know, I, I sacrificed, you know, even, you know, a relationship, uh, and, and, and mm -hmm. some friendships. And, um, I made that decision purposefully and I'm okay with that decision because it's, it's a goal that is a shorter time frame. I know it's a 36 month plan that I'm, mm -hmm. you know, whatever my own months in. Um, the first thing I'll, I'll say is like, you know, you have to define who you want to be. Um, I don't intend on changing this version of me ever. So, you know, Bob Iger, the CEO of Disney, if you, you marry Bob Iger, you know, he's the CEO of Disney, right? He's going to be working <laughs> a lot. Um, the first thing is I'm very clear now, and I don't believe I'm going to change my 
desire to work. I love to work. Um, doesn't mean I can't balance and which is something I'm working on. So first thing is like, I've decided like, Hey, I'm going to work Monday through Friday. I'm going to work early into the night, but then when I'm not working, I'm going to turn off and I'm actually doing a much better job at that than I used to. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's like deciding who you're going to be. And so that's number one. Um, number two, I think it's, it's recognizing that life has seasons. And so currently I am in a season of like last night I was on the phone till 1130 at night. And that's just the season I'm in. Um, I've had times in my previous business where I remember thinking like, I have nothing to do. It's, it's Friday morning and I could just go yeah. to the beach if I want to. And mm -hmm. so I think I have a unique experience of knowing where things can go with the business um, and keeping my eye on a prize. And then, and then the other thing is, you know, this is not my goal, but if you're building a business, if you're listening to you're building a business, you know, one of the aha moments I had was when I sold my last business and I divided what I made per year, or excuse me, I, I added what I made per year to what I made and then divided it by the time it's an incredible amount of money versus a job. And so I sometimes remind myself, Hey, maybe you go this hard for 36 months and then you can pull back for mm. two years and then maybe I go fast again for a year. So life comes in seasons. I remind myself of that. Um, and then truthfully, um, you're, you're right. There is a great team behind me. So, um, you know, they're working just as hard. So it's, it's a, it's a balancing act for sure. Yeah. And I, I really appreciate that transparency because I think a lot of times people are afraid to say that it's hard. Uh, you know, often people ask all the time, because to your point, I do have three kids and right now they're sick like every other friggin' week. I mean, we were supposed to have this podcast last week and I was like, Dan, I got a kid in the ER, gotta go. And they say, oh, how do you do it all? And the truth is, is that I don't. When I can do a lot, I do it. And then there's times that I don't. And I, you know, I've, I've made the decision kind of like you where I'm working Monday through Friday as much as possible. And then on the weekends, like, don't call me, don't call me, don't text me. I'm not posting on LinkedIn because it's very easy to get lost in that emotional pull. Like say you're spending time with your family and feeling like, oh, I have all this stuff to get done, you know, at work or you're at work and you're like, oh shoot, I really want to join that. You know, friends are going out to dinner and I'm deciding not to go. When you know, I've tried to make it so that I've, I'm taking that choice away from myself. Like, nope, you are not allowed to work here. So you can be a hundred percent present with your family, or now you can be a hundred percent present at work. And I felt like that is, that's helped my mentality as a business owner. And also just as a human, um, because I think that as entrepreneurs, we put so much pressure on ourselves to do it all and do it all, all the time. And it's just not sustainable. Um, so switching gears a little bit to to Voda. This is a, a business that a lot of people would deem not sexy. But what I tell people, and, and because I'm in the home services space myself, is you know, we're giving people back their time. So that obviously resonates very well with you and I. So why for Voda do you did you decide to go both cleaning and restoration? Because while that seems like Oh, that's great. We offer both. That just opened up, you know, the the customer market twofold. It also opens up your competitor twofold. It opens up your, you know, your need for certain employees, your hours, all of this stuff. So what was the thought decision behind doing that and keeping that? Because I know you acquired the brand, um, but I'm sure that, that that was a decision that was purposefully made. Yeah, well, you know, and, and, and by the way, just on the time management thing, just to, to put a pin in that, like, you know, the other thing is like, being very clear with what you're going to focus on. So for me, like it's tough because I've decided like I, if it doesn't sell franchise units, help my franchise owners that are already in business or mm -hmm. have to do with hiring someone or you know, working with my team, I'm shutting out a lot of other things. And it's tough. Mm -hmm. like, you know, for example, like if you're in the supplier side, like it's a, it's an addicting area uh, to, mm -hmm. to go to all the things that I like to go. I love the, the events and I think they all benefit me you can only do so many things. And so I made a decision somewhat recently and I've been focused on, if it's not a franchisee, prospective franchisee or teammate. It always takes the back burner. And I don't feel mm -hmm. guilty if I don't go to everything in life. And if I do those three things, I'll be successful. Um, as far as, you know, Voda, um, you know, restoration. So I'm not a restoration guy that got into franchising. I'm a franchise guy that got into restoration. Yeah. Um, when we were looking at what business, my partner, Zach Nolte, and I, when we were looking at what we were going to do, um, we started, forget about industries. We just had a piece of paper and we made a playbook of what we wanted. We wanted, we were both affected by recessions in our last business. Mm -hmm. We wanted recession proof. 
We want a third party to pay. That means either insurance, the government, giant hmm. company, something where you could pay the bill easily, not people. My last business paid, people paid, you know, small business owners paid and they felt the money a lot more than the insurance company would or the huh. government. Um, so we wanted third party pay. We wanted recession proof. We wanted pandemic resistant. Um, and then we wanted an industry that was growing. Uh, outside of that, there's a lot of industries, but then we also wanted a large labor pool. So we didn't want skilled labor. We wanted non-licensed labor. So plumbing, I love. It's all those things we mentioned, except people need a special skill. Restoration, believe it or not, anyone with a smile and a good attitude and, and good with their hands can do the, water, the work. So our labor pool is bigger. Huh. Um, I knew from a franchise development standpoint, restoration has always been a favorite of candidates, people that buy franchises and, and franchise consultants. Um, and we wanted something that actually made a difference. And it's kind of cool helping people during a time of need. All that said, only negative restoration is I can't convince you to dry your house right now, unless I sneak a hose in your window and turn it on and do like the water equivalent of, of, of you know, larceny or whatever the saying is. I can't do, I can't convince you to dry your house. And right. so, you know, my background is lead gen and sales. And so we wanted something where we could persuade people to say, Hey, you know, you need your house or your floor, you know, excuse me, you need your floors or your carpets cleaned. And so, um, we love that there's that predictability of cleaning, which leads to more restoration and kind of mm -hmm. helps offset this lumpiness, if you will, of revenue month over month. We have that in the cleaning. Yeah. And I didn't ever think there's two things that I haven't thought of. So, and it makes a lot of sense because once you're into a home, I mean, it's second nature for me to be like, hey, do you guys clean your carpets? Or like, if I have a pest control guy and all of a sudden I see mice, I'm going to be like, bro, do you do mice? Where, you know, you've already pre-established that relationship. So essentially you become the, not only the maintenance guy, but, you know, the restoration or the fixer. And, and so have you seen a lot of clients go that route or do, is it the other way around? Or is it like 50-50 where they go restoration to maintenance or maintenance to restoration? At the end of the day, the majority of our business for restoration, restoration is the, the, the main, you know, revenue. We love restoration. Okay. It comes from like property managers and plumbers. When you go mm -hmm. to a property manager and you can't get in with restoration, but you can get in with, um, you can get in with, um, with, with cleaning. Now you can start yeah. to build that relationship. It gets your foot in the door. Right. Um, and so, you know, if you Google what are the best leads for restoration, one of them is carpet cleaning lead or carpet cleaning businesses. So we have huh. our own business that's a referral source for the other side of the business. They, they work really well, well together. Um, and it's just what I really love about what we're doing. Like we have over 2000 five-star reviews on our flagship location. And because we, because we're driving around town doing these $560 average cleaning jobs, carpet cleaning jobs, we're doing a lot more of them, which means a lot more reviews, which leads a lot more people, uh, SEO mm -hmm. value. And so our restoration company benefits from an SEO value, the more that we clean floors and the trucks are driving right. around more than just staying dormant, you know, because what I always tell people is you don't know about restoration because it's not a fire truck screaming down the street. When your neighbor mm -hmm. has a water event, you don't know about it. And so mm -hmm. it's the sleeping industry. It's a $300 billion industry, 210 commercial, 80 billion residential. And, um, you know, people said to me, Oh, there's, or there's competitors. There's actually not serve pro is a $3 billion company. You know, it's 1%. And so we're actually competing with the mom and pops the you know, that are mm -hmm. less organized, less sophisticated. And so there's plenty of market share. And again, I'll share with you something in our world of franchising, in our little world, there's all these companies in the market, the total addressable market, which is 350 American people. There is not a lot of restoration companies. And so <laughs> the one thing I tell people is don't make these decisions. You know, one of the biggest things I've learned in my life, and sorry, I'm a little long winded here, but like, no, it's I used to live in one town and then I moved to other areas that were similar to that town. I mm -hmm. went to, I lived in Hoboken with my friends from similar towns. And then when I moved to New York city and I started to branch out, I started to like understand there's so many more perspectives. And um, when you're making decisions, you have to understand that you probably have this uh, information bias where you're making decisions with a very small sample size. So for my example, a restoration, there's actually a tremendous amount of market share in restoration. Um, it's super fragmented. And mm -hmm. um, if you think just because there's a couple of restoration companies in franchising, that has nothing to do with, even if you have 300 locations, there's so many more sure. markets available. 
Yeah, no, that that is a good point. Because as I'm thinking, like, because our maid pros, we've decided to not, but there was a time where like, do we do carpet cleaning too? And then, you know, where we're looking at the competitive landscape, a lot of the times it's the Stanley Steve, like it's all franchising. But to your point, you know, outside of that, one, there probably, to your point, there isn't any, you know, major, major competitors that own, a, you know, the majority of the market. And two, how much do you trust them? I know you're there as much as people sometimes say, oh, I don't like franchising. I like, you know, small businesses, you know, the ones that don't understand franchising. I think there is definitely a certain level of trust that comes with a brand that, you know, franchising, franchising supports. Um, and, you know, my next question, Dan, is I have not talked to someone whose billing relies mostly on that third party. So what? how does that work? Because I think when people think, insurance, collection, all of that thing. They think nightmare. They think a long time. They think they're never going to, the payout's never going to happen. So how do you guys handle that to make sure that it's, you know, streamlined and you don't have a lot of the headaches because you're not going direct to consumer for payment? Well, the first thing is there's 14,000 water events every day in America. Every, every day? day? Holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> and not just hurricanes. It's pipes breaking, toilets overflowing, kids leaving mm -hmm. a bathtub, running a pool overflowing into the basement, some pump breaking. I mean, it goes on and on, especially pipes. The average age of a home in America is 39 years. So there's a lot of water events unrelated to weather events. And so, mm -hmm. and the average ticket of a home dry is about $3,000. And if you can think about it, what does it cost to take a truck, drive it to a house, put a hose, extract the water into the truck, cut the drywall, dry the floors and leave? It's pretty straightforward. Insurance mm -hmm. actually is okay paying it more so because they are happy. I'm not happy, but they want to pay for the infrastructure. They want to get the infrastructure damage fixed. Mm -hmm. When they get less uh, lenient with paying is the construction, the rebuild, which makes Got sense. Right? At the end of the day, you and I can argue about how many people it takes to rebuild the wall behind you and how much material and why you use that mm -hmm. type of material. Much dirtier and harder to uh, I quantify. Water restoration extraction is just literally a hose equipment, sucking water out, extracting water out and drying it with some air movers. So they pay oh. easier, they pay quicker, they pay more, you know, efficiently. Um, what people get confused is if you're getting all your work from third party administrative work, TPA work, mm -hmm. um, there's all kinds of cuts that you got to give to the TPA and they get a percentage and they take a while to pay and insurance mm -hmm. doesn't pay. And that's a nightmare. We focus on property managers and plumbers because when you get the work from them, it's a much more expedient pay from the insurance company. And mm. it's not like insurance isn't paying, they're paying. You don't have to use XYZ insurance company. Sometimes you do, but not always mm -hmm. to get your work, work, work done. So we still get paid by insurance. We just don't get all of our work through insurance parties. Got it. Okay. Yeah. That makes a lot more sense. And it, I also like how you broke it down of like, they're not going to fight you to clean it up. They'll fight you for the rebuild because I'm sure a lot of people are also like, ah, I've, I've been wanting to get my uh, kitchen redone too. So, you know, <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of, there's a lot more wiggle room in terms of, of fighting that. Um, go and ahead. You're unhappy. You know, when you, when I come to your house, if I got the water out, you're like, Oh, thank God my house is dry. Now the construction's what takes weeks and you're unhappy. So we just mm -hmm. stay in the area that we make, uh, make all the profit. Now, how many locations do you guys have now? Um, we launched, we started taking franchise candidates in like, in like July. Um, we have 32 locations and or units sold just for clarity. They, they're all sure. Clarity, but 32. Sure. And then you mentioned hurricanes and, you know, restoration, that's a, that can be a tough, a tough thing, especially to your point when, when families are in need, houses are destroyed, hurricanes or whatever. Is there any sort of, extra infrastructure you have to have for instance like if you have a franchise in north carolina for whatever reason this hurricane comes through and destroys you know your trucks are the ones that are going to be called on but also you know did the franchisee have to stick that out do you have to put people in dangerous situations like have you guys thought of that at all because you're in that kind of more dangerous gameplay yeah. So like, for example, in North Carolina, we have our success coach. Her name is Shannon Hauser, and she's been in restoration since the early 2000s. And she's there to support franchise partners in that region. We have a, our VP of operations who's in Dallas, Texas, supporting mm -hmm. all of the franchise owners in, in Texas. And as we continue to expand markets, we put success coaches in their, their markets to help them with, with the different work. Um, you know, uh, in, in markets where there's more weather-related or emergency-related work, um, what I love about restoration is 
um, our franchise owners can actually go do that work and they can, first of all, all the people I'm attract, we're attracting is a certain type of person. They want to make money. Nobody gets into restoration saying like, it's a passion project. <laughs> and so, um, they, they have some level of, I always say our ideal franchise buyer has two things going for them or about them. One, they're the mayor of the town. Mm -hmm. Like when I was a kid and playing sports, like jerseys had the contracting business on the back, the last name of the guy, you know, John Conforti or whatever Italian mm -hmm. guy who owned the business and everyone loved him. He was the mayor of the town or, or he or she, right? The mayor of the town personality. It's super important. And then number two, um, they need to love action. Like it's funny. Our franchise development director, his name is Steve and him and I are very close. We talk a lot every day mm -hmm. and um, we love action. Like I could be at the beach and then a few hours later, I want, I want to deal this weekend I was I was looking at real estate because I need I need that action. I love <laughs> action. And so we need people who love action. When you get into restoration, you enjoy like getting there and dealing with the problem and knowing that like, hey, this is a massive job that I'm gonna get paid mm -hmm. on. Um, so yeah, I mean, but yes, we do have a lot of in infrastructure to help them in uh in, in, in emergency situations. And I guess my last, you know, piece here, because we're coming up on time is, you know, your background and you said you have a passion for kind of that sales and selling and, you know, getting those leads, you know, what would be your advice to franchisors out there that are saying our franchisees aren't getting enough leads, not for brand debt, but more on the consumer side, you know, what are your tricks or tips for success there? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, first thing I'll say is like, I've kind of realized in my 20s, I was hobbling along because I tried to do the things I'm not good at. And now I only do the things I'm good at. And I have part, you know, teammates doing the things I'm not good at. We're moving mm -hmm. rapid pace than where I was before. Um, so find a partner who has the opposite skills. If you're not the same skills, the opposite skills. Mm -hmm. Number two, or, or uh, you know, head of uh, a head executive. Um, when it comes to finding customers, what I've shifted my mindset, and I think it's a, it's a lot of times about mindset, right? Um, so I used to think we're going to sell franchises and then we're going to help them find customers. Mm -hmm. And where we've shifted our mindset to is we are going to find customers and then need franchisees in those markets. So to give you an example on the Voda side, you know, we have an outbound It just recently launched and I don't like talking about a ton cause it's still in like development, but sure. um, you know, I don't want people to buy a Voda under like, this is like something we're doing, but it's something we are working on. We launched a call center that reaches outbound to, to, uh, to perspective, uh, property managers and plumbers, we email them, we call them, we text them, we direct, like we're like hitting property managers like crazy. And, um, you know, we're obsessed with how do we help make the phone ring? We have regional salespeople that we're looking at hiring and like my, every day I wake up thinking like, how am I going to move the needle selling franchises? And how am I going to move the needle bringing in revenue for franchise owners? And it's funny, like, just to give you uh, where that comes from, it, it's somewhat selfishly coming from a place of, I realized that if and when we award a hundred people franchises and we have a couple, you know, 300 units in America after that, and let's say the territories are, are you know, really a lot of them are, are awarded and sold. Um, after that, I can only control my income based on increasing the revenues of averaging the volume of our franchise owners. And so mm -hmm. instead of like sitting back and waiting for them to bring in business, we want to try to help them bring as much business as possible. So my, my advice is, you know, zero in on that mindset and then just start doing things that are unsustainable. Like, you know, for right now, um, some of the stuff we're doing, I don't know if I can do it for a hundred franchise owners, but I'm doing it now. And that's leading to more revenue, more royalties that we can then reinvest. So do things for your franchise owners that are like great. I called the lead recently that uh, we a big job that we, we lost. I called myself. I'm like, Hey, you know, I understand you're looking at using Stanley Steamer. I own Voda. We're new in Dallas. We want to earn your business. We'll come do it for cheaper. Just give us a review. Like do crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. um, that's what they bought an emerging brand for. You're supposed to be doing things different than I'm not going to do that when we have 50 units, but I'm doing it right now um, because I'm going to do whatever it takes to help my franchisees. Dan, I absolutely love that. And there's so many Zor mastermind groups out there and you see they go to the emerging brand conference and they're all trying to emulate the greats, but sometimes to an extent that it, they might lose a little bit of that. You got to do the crazy shit. You got to be insane. You got to break through the noise. I think that 
There was some stat out there that's like an astounding percentage of franchises never give, get above 10 units. Why is that? I don't know. Maybe everyone's just trying to do the exact same thing. And, you know, you shouldn't necessarily have to have a brand new industry, a brand new vertical, a brand new technology that makes you stand out. Sometimes it's it's who you have. And, and I get a lot of questions in, in franchise development of, you know, what's the silver bullet? I'm like, it's you. You are the silver bullet. If you can make it go, you know, you have all of the tactics, um, you know, to, to piece together and, and do that. So Dan, lastly, you know, what is next for you? What's next for you? What's next for Voda? I know you said you have a 36 month plan and you're, you know, some way through that. Um, but you know, what are those next steps and what we, what can we expect? Yeah, you know, we, our goal is to be at, you know, 50 units with Voda by the, uh, the end of this year, which we're on track mm-hmm. to do. And, um, you know, still figuring out the, the development goals for 2024, because, you know, uh, at the end of the day, you want to grow fast, but you want to grow, you know, sustainably. So we're, we're looking at how our openings are going, but we're definitely going to continue to picking up uh, development momentum. The good news is the more units we award, the more we just reinvest it back into I mean, That's the other thing to remember. Your franchise fees are not your money. Mm-hmm. Your franchise. So I would take in a paycheck out of Voda ever. I, I just recently paid myself actually, but not a lot. And the truth is the money for me, the day we're taking a couple million dollars in EBITDA from royalty revenue, we deserve that money. I can go out and do whatever I want. That's my money, my, my portion of it. Until then, franchise fees are not your money. Don't get all excited. Oh, you sold, you know, 32. Good. Keep the money in the bank. It's not your money. That was money invested in your business and the, the, together. And so if you can sell franchises and keep the franchise fees and put it back into the business, don't go out spending it. That's like the discipline that I've learned, um, you know, because in my previous business, you know, maybe we did the something opposite where we were, you know, enjoying that money. Like keep mm-hmm. the money in there. You don't need a ton of money to live usually. Like, you know, keep don't change your lifestyle. Um, and, and that would be my number one, you know, piece of advice to people when they're, when they're doing it. And then the last thing is like, you know, it takes work. Like I get on an airplane to meet franchise kids that are ready to sign. And everyone's like, you know, that's crazy. It is. It is. Yes. It is very crazy. It's very tiring. I don't like always doing it when I get there. It's exciting. Um, but I'm not doing it because I like it. It's, it's hard work. Do this stuff. You know, you, you go on those masterminds or you go to a conference and you see someone so far along and their chapter 30 is not your chapter. It's, you know, they're there. Everybody makes it look easier than it was. And mm-hmm. just so don't like block that out and do whatever little gritty stuff you got to do every single day. And then eventually that you'll get past that. But that's my advice. Like franchise, you know, franchising is not glamorous. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, and I assume it's probably going to be hard for someone who's thinking about doing it, but it's very rewarding. Awesome. Dan, well, thank you so much for, uh, your advice here. We look forward to watching you and Voda grow. If you guys want to connect with Dan or want more information on Voda, you can check them out online or connect with him on LinkedIn. Um, Dan, we will, we'll talk to you soon. (laughs) Thanks again. Thanks for listening to The Art of Franchise Marketing. This show is brought to you by NetSertif. We help franchise brands and multi-location businesses run localized digital marketing at scale. To learn more, visit netsertif.com.